Word. We are in our third installment of our Meals with Jesus series. And uh, we're exploring moments in the Bible where Jesus had a simple meal with people. But in the midst of the meal, Jesus revealed who he is. Now, all of us will have had different experiences of school, and I'm sure we've all had a moment where we've maybe asked, you know, maybe your kids or your grandkids, what's your favorite part of the day at school? And a lot of them will say, lunchtime, right? Not for the food, but just for the break from class. And I don't know if you had, when you went to school, if you had school dinners or whether you had packed lunch. But my brother and I, we were sent to primary school with a wee packed lunch. And I'll tell you what, we Donna can make us just a good chicken mayo sandwich now as she could then. We got a wee packed lunch. And this morning I've brought my lunchbox with me today. Now I know what you're thinking. It's a bigger version <laughs> of my lunchbox. It's not the real thing. I saw those judgmental eyes. Yeah. Big enough so everybody can see at the balcony and at home, I promise, right? You're going, well, that explains the post-wedding weekend, Pastor. Mm, yeah. <laughs> this is my wee lunchbox. And when I would have been in school, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, where when it was time for lunch and everybody opened their lunchboxes, you would get the question, what's in your lunchbox? And it was always with the motivation of, not just out of interest, it was, what's in your lunchbox that I can swap for what's in my lunchbox, right? And all of a sudden, the classroom would turn into a trading floor of Wall Street, right? One cheese string for a petty flu, one cheese string for a petty flu. And everybody would be swapping things over and things are being passed around with that one question, what's in your lunchbox? The title of our message this morning is what's in your lunchbox. Let's pray as we come to the word. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. That, Father, you cut into the most deep place in us to give us healing and that we might hear from heaven. Lord, this morning, no matter what kind of week we have had, we open our ears and we open our hearts to hear the voice of the Father. Lord, as the kids are across the way and the kids team, Lord, we pray that over there in the sports hall this morning, that even the littlest would hear of Jesus, that there would be a young generation across the way that would be raised in the things of God. And in Jesus' name, the church said, amen. So this morning, our next meal with Jesus is perhaps one of the more famous ones, where if it happened today, it might feature a lunchbox with five loaves and two fish. It is, of course, the feeding of the 5,000. Now, we're going to lean into different accounts because they're mentioned in all the Gospels. And so we'll be moving from the book of John into the book of Mark as to how this story, beginning, if you like, with a lunchbox, a meal that is shared by Jesus. Let's read it together, beginning in Mark chapter 6. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so the disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Then send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. So here's the story so far. People are beginning to set up and take notice of this Jesus around Israel. This, by this stage, Jesus had turned water into wine. He had been hailed publicly as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world by John the Baptist. In other words, he points out and he says, this is the one you have been waiting for. 
Jesus has healed, delivered, and set free. But now we see him encounter a problem. These crowds drawn by what he was doing were following him. And when we read that it began to get late and the disciples come to Jesus and say, look, we're in the middle of nowhere. Everybody's hungry. Let's send the people away to get some food. Now, in my mind, when I read that, I think, no, the disciples were probably thinking, no, we're hungry and we need some food. Let's send the people away, right? It's probably a bit of both. The disciples identified a problem and they gave Jesus a solution. But the Lord being the Lord, of course, throws a spanner in the works. They say, look, this is how we can feed these hungry people. And Jesus says, well, you do it. And you can imagine the reaction of the disciples. Is, in, is, he, is he pointing at me or is he pointing? No, he's, he's pointing at us. Jesus says, you feed them. And it's this sense of, well, how on earth are we going to do that? This is what happens next. Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we going to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Now, I did a wee bit of a, search, or a Google search this week and found that at the census in 2011, there were about 28,000 people living in Carrickfergus at that time. And scholars would reckon that although this is called the feeding of the 5,000, more realistically, there was probably a crowd of anywhere between 10 and 20,000 following Jesus. And so really what's happening is Jesus is saying, most of Carrick Fergus needs lunch. What are you going to do about it? Now, I don't know if you've ever had an experience, maybe in prayer, or maybe, <laughs> maybe even with a pastor. I grew up in a pastor's home, so I've seen this, where somebody goes, we have a problem, and the pastor goes, well, what are you going to do about it, right? Or maybe you've had that in the house, right, where you said, mom, this is going on. She says, well, what are you going to do about it, right? Jesus turns around and he says, what are you going to do about it? I love it when Jesus asks these kind of questions. If we were to look at John 6 and the account there, he says this to Philip. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip. Can you bring up that scripture, lads? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Why does Jesus do this? After all, if we think back, when was the last time a group of Israelites were in the desert and they need, sorry, in the wilderness and they were hungry? Book of Exodus, journey to the promised land, and what happens? Manna from heaven. God sends bread from heaven. And so they're maybe looking at him thinking, Well, if you've done it before, why can't you do it again? God, you were in the business of bringing bread from heaven, and now you're asking us to do something? Why does Jesus put out this question to the disciples? There's a general principle here throughout Scripture that simply says this, God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. God doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. Isn't it amazing today that the Holy Spirit wants to partner with you and I to bring his plans and purposes on the earth? That he would use our lives, that he would use our church, that God's will would be done in Carrick Fergus as it is in heaven. That instead of Jesus stepping back like in Old Testament times and just doing something for the people of God, Jesus is establishing a new order that says, my people will partner with me in my work. This morning we're invited to partner with the Holy Spirit with what Jesus is doing in the earth. Of course there would be things that it would be better if Jesus clicked his fingers and it would happen. But instead he says, I want to work in and through my people. But we just need to be aware that he's inviting us into that partnership. Now how does that work? If God wants to use you and I this morning, and I know that's a really basic statement and a very basic teaching, that Jesus wants to use my life to do something for his glory. But where does that actually begin? This is what Jesus says in the next scripture. How many loaves do you have? He asked. 
go and see. Now, how did the disciples respond to that question? Basically, Jesus says, well, what have you got? What do you have that we can use? And the disciples respond with this. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? So Andrew manages to find this wee lad who, as tradition rightly or wrongly says, had, bring a pack, had brought a packed lunch with him. And if we were to think of it today, this wee lad would have been standing there with his wee lunch box, with his five loaves and two fish that his mum packed them. And this is what they have. And Andrew turns around and he says, this is what we have, but what good is that? Church, this morning, how many times have we looked into the lunchbox of our lives? How many times have we looked at what we can offer God and thought, what good is that? Perhaps this morning, it's time to lift the spirit of what good is that? There's a wee story, and pastors tell it all the time, and it's a, about a, a wee boy on a beach, and he comes down to the beach, and it's full of starfish everywhere, and they've been left behind by the tide. And he understands that if he doesn't get these starfish into the sea as quick as humanly possible, then they're going to die. And what he begins to do, he begins to pick up a starfish at a time, and he throws it into the sea, and then he does it again and again and again. And then a man walks past him, and he says, son, what are you doing? He goes, you're only one person, and look at all these starfish. What difference are you going to make? And he says, well, I made a difference to that one, and I've made a difference to that one, and to that one, and he kept making the difference what he could. He couldn't do it all, but he did what he could. Church, this wee lad didn't have it all in his lunchbox to feed a crowd of thousands, but he gave what he had, and he gave it all, and God used it for his glory. Church, if we give what we have and we give it all, God will use it for his glory. Amen? What's in your lunchbox this morning? Is God placing his hand on something in your life where you thought, what good is that? Is he saying to you, maybe if you would give it back to me, something that you used to serve me with, but you no longer do. If you would give it back to me, I would use you for my glory. If you would give me your career or lack thereof, I'll use you for my glory. If you give me your education or lack thereof, I'll use you for my glory. If you give me your relationships or lack thereof, I'll use you for my glory. If you give me your time or lack thereof, I'll use you for glory. My glory, church, what is the Lord asking of you this morning? Whatever it is that you have, that if you were to give it all, he would use you for his glory. What happens next? This is what the scripture says. Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told the disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Now, usually when the story is told, we imagine that when Jesus blesses and he breaks the loaves and the fish, that, I don't know, sometimes this is how it works in my mind, just loads of it turned up and everybody was able to eat. That out of nowhere, there was lots of bread and there was lots of fish, but that's not what the text says. If we were to slow it down and to read it carefully, Jesus blessed the bread, he broke the bread, the same five loaves, and he just began to hand it to the disciples. Now, you can imagine the first moment that he gave, let's say, Peter the first bit of bread, right? And he goes, there you go, Peter. And he's like, there's 10,000 people out there. 
But he has to go around and he goes, here you go. Don't take too much, right? But what happens is Jesus continues to break the bread. He continues to break the fish and it won't run out. The five loaves and the two fish were never going to be enough until he blessed it. Church, whatever we have to give to God will never be enough until he blesses it. And maybe for some of us this morning, we can discount all the things that we have to offer the Lord and we could easily say, what good is that? If you would place it in his hands, if you would say, Lord, it's not much, but if you would bless it, if you would use it, I know you'll use me for your glory. Church this morning, what's in your lunchbox? There's a, a wee experience that Chloe and I have, which we call the, the miracle of the ice pops. And you've maybe heard me tell this story before, but we were at, in the church we grew up in, we were at Bible Week and we were serving on the, the kids team that year. And at the end of every night, there would have been maybe over 100, 120 odd kids would have been there. But at the end of every single night, we would have had an absolute ton of ice pops that we would have got out. And it was brilliant. All the kids got a nice pop. All the leaders got a nice pop as a reward for all their hard work. But there was one night, I think it might have been the final night, where tragedy struck and we didn't have enough ice pops. We had counted and we had counted again. And the key leader who was there at that time said, look, guys, we don't have enough ice pops. Now, if you're a kid's leader and you've been there all week, that's a crisis, right? She said, look, most of the kids will get an ice pop, but tonight you guys probably won't. And what we find is, is we were given out these ice pops, which we knew weren't enough. I don't know what happened. I genuinely don't. But they never ran out. And when it came to the end of the night, I still remember this so vividly. There was a tray. All the kids had gone home. There was a tray sitting in the hall with ice pops left over. Now, either we had genuinely saw the Lord work something so simple or we had miscalculated the ice pops. I'll let you decide. But the point is this. What we give to God may not be enough, but when he blesses it, it's always enough. This morning, what's in your lunchbox? I remember a, a story, and I'm going to do my best to tell it the best that I can, um, of a church who sometimes felt that they didn't have enough. And the pastor went across to this conference, and I'm going to try and remember this the best that I can, and if I make a mistake, I'm sorry. But he went to this conference with a whole load of other pastors. Some of the churches were much larger than his, had more finance than his, had more academic and study and research, all put into their ministries, into their work. And as he's sitting there and he's listening, the pastors get up and they're saying, well, we have X amount of giving this year. We have this amount of academia in our church who are doing study and research. And we have all these great theologians and we're doing this and that. And it's absolutely amazing. Our church is like this wide and this big and it's brilliant. And the pastor of this church gets up and he says, my church doesn't have any of that. We don't have lots of this and we don't have lots of that. But I have a church that gives what it has and they give it all. The church he was talking about was this church many years ago. Carrick Nazarene, will we be a church that continues to give what it has and give it all. And church, when we give what we have and we give it all, we hold nothing back. Full five loaves, full two fish. When God blesses that, we will see miracles in the mundane. We will see multiplication with something so simple. When we give to the Lord what we have and we give it all. Now, what was the point to this whole miracle. The, the worship team are going to join me on the platform. What was the point of this entire miracle? Was it just to feed the hungry? Or was there something else going on in the midst? Was there something else going on as this wee lad hands his lunchbox over? Was there something else going on as Jesus broke the bread and he broke the fish and it multiplied? See, so often when we tell the story, whether it's in kids church or whether it's here, we usually finish at the 12 baskets of leftovers, don't we? And we usually wrap up the story there, but that's not where the story ends. 
In fact, it continues on into the next day from John chapter 6, verses 22 and onwards. And what happens is the crowds follow Jesus across the Sea of Galilee. Now, what they're thinking is, this guy's going to feed us for free, for life, amen, right? They're following Jesus across the Sea of Galilee. And when they finally catch up to him, he says, guys, you, you don't get it. <laughs> I think you've missed the point of what's just happened. He says, you think I've come to give you physical bread? He says, no, no, no. I haven't come just to fill your tummy. I've come to fill your heart. I've come to fill the God-shaped hole that is in every man and woman. His point was this. Yes, I've given you physical bread, but God has sent you another bread. I am that bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am everything that you have been looking for. I am the one who satisfies. And if anybody would take of me the bread of life, they will never hunger again. If they drink of me, they will never thirst again. And what Jesus was doing, this is the point of the miracle. With this wee lad's lunchbox, he takes what he can give and he uses it to reveal himself to people who need him. He takes what this wee lad could give and through that, the dead are told they can be made alive and the lost are told they can be found and the blind can be told that they can be seen all because a wee lad gave what he had and he gave it all. Church, Jesus will be revealed in your life. Where you are and who you do life with. He will be revealed through you when you give what you have and you give it all. Church, this morning, what's in your lunchbox? What is the Lord asking for you to give to him that he could use you for his glory? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to you humbly and we say thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you don't choose to do things on your own, but Lord, you invite us to be used by you in the earth. That Lord, you have set over every single one of us, no matter what life may look like for us, to be used by you. Lord, I thank you that you simply ask us, what do you have? I thank you, Lord, that what we have will never be enough. But when you bless it, when you use it, it can multiply in miraculous ways that, Lord, you would receive the glory. Father, would you remind us again, would you call us again to give what we have to you and that we would give it all, holding nothing back, Lord, that you would use us for your glory where we are and who we are. That, Lord, you would touch this church afresh, that you would use us for your glory in our community. That when we give what we have and we give it all, God, you'll use us. And in Jesus' name, we all said, amen.